Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Andrew. And I'm Rachel. And we are Peaks of the Scene podcast. We are a true crime podcast aiming to put you, the listener, at the scene of the crime. Each week we delve into the murky world of lesser known crimes from the UK and Ireland. And occasionally we also venture into renowned cases from around the globe. We are available on all major social media channels. Just search for our name and I'm sure you'll find us. Also, if you'd like to and you have the capability, do drop us a rating and review as well, wherever you can. Now, if you like us that much that you want to support us and see us carry on doing this for the foreseeable future, then please do head over to Patreon where you can support us for as little as £1 a month. We have bonus content and episodes and depending on your tier, we have other... Um, what should we call it? it? <laughs> Tears? We have uh, no, oh we have, benefits. Oh, we're benefits. Yeah, that's the one. And it really does help us carry on. To find us, there's always a link in our show notes, or you can simply Google Picture the Scene Podcast and Patreon, and the top option will be us. As with any true crime podcast, listening discretion is always advised, and today there is no exception. And we do, where possible, now release our episodes a week early for our patient supporters. So if you want to hear next week's episode right this second, head over to Patreon. Although, Rachel, maybe not this exact second, because they're going to stop listening to this episode then. So maybe after this episode. Yeah, it'd be good if you just like hold fire until the end of the episode and then head over to Patreon. But if you've got a really bad memory, like I have, you can pause the episode, head over, subscribe, and then come back to us, okay? How have you been, Rachel? Yeah, all good. I've been uh, just in the throes of, like, yeah, baby life over the last week since we last spoke. It feels like yesterday. That's how weird time feels. That's I, I messaged Andrew this morning and said, is it recording day today? Like, yeah, completely gone over my head. So uh, I really feel for Andrew at the minute because there's going to be a lot of that. But all good. How are you? I am good. I'm sparkly. Thank you very much. It's been, it, it's been a very profitable week this week, so it's good. Ooh, sounds good. The question is, oh, Rachel, are you ready for some true crime? Oh, I was born ready, Andrew. That's what I thought, so that's what your mum told me. So, <laughs> <laughs> is it going to be one of them days? It's not, but maybe, but it's a bit of a bit of a brutal listen today, so I'll get a bit of a joke in now. Um, oh, okay, yeah. So today's episode, although I haven't seen it, I believe it's a well-known because they made a BBC drama about it a year or two oh. ago. I haven't seen the drama, but I still wanted to cover it. And because we also have more people who listen to us outside of the UK than in it, so maybe they don't know about the case as well. So if it's safe for you to do so, I'd like you to relax. Close your eyes and picture the scene. Today I'd like to take us back to the 14th of July, 1973. And we're heading off to Britain Ferry. Now, Britain Ferry is a town in West Glamorgan in Wales. These days, it has a population of around 6,000 people. But back in 1973, it was closer to 3,000. And it was a close, tight-knit community. And at the time, the largest employer was BP, which employed around 2,500 people from the town and local surrounding areas. So, yeah, you've got an idea of what the area is like. We're going to be heading off the night time to the very early hours actually in the morning around 1 a.m to be exact and sandra newton who is 16 and she worked in a local cardboard factory she was known to go out twice a week with saturday night being one of the nights she'd go out and the 14th of july was a saturday night so sandra she did have a boyfriend he was never named and no details were ever released about him so i don't know anything of her then we know she was with him in the local club that she was in. We also know that he was married. So for him, it was an affair. And Sandra did know about his relationship status. Oh, wow. I was having a conversation with a friend yesterday, actually, who um, had, let's, shall we call it, a proposition from a married man. And, um, and it's mad, like, how your either accepting of it or you're not like yeah you, you know some people are like flattered and like the thrill and all of that and then others are like oh you're absolute scumbag you're, you're no friend of mine anymore do you know and that's it kind of friendship over so um it, it's interesting the take on it this particular woman is is married with kids and 
so she herself was in a bit of a predicament and and went like well I'd rather sever the ties and not have a friendship anymore but you know we we were talking about it in a group setting and we were like well there are other women stroke men that might have been like oh okay that sounds exciting do you know do you know what I mean I know what you mean I mean I would never I would never do that anyway but from the male perspective you've got to have some balls haven't you if you're married to proposition another woman especially if they're also married as well with the confidence that if you're gonna do it you've probably got confidence that you're gonna get an acceptance out haven't you yeah exactly yeah I don't think I'd even if I had an inclination which I don't I still probably wouldn't have the balls to uh, do that but yeah it's I don't know I've not got that mindset but yeah it's it's an odd one isn't it um but she was 16 as well Sandra let's not forget she was yeah so Sandra left the club with her lover at 1 a.m and they found her way to an abandoned van that was in a quiet spot nearby and in that van they proceeded to make love finishing up at around 2 a.m nothing quite says romance like an abandoned van does it Rachel I know, and and I'm, I hate to be very practical about these things, but how bloody cold would it have been? That yeah, yeah. that would not have been comfortable or pleasant for anyone. No. Yeah, they finished up around 2am, and when they had finished, they parted ways because they lived in opposite directions, with Sandra planning on doing what she usually did, which was walk home the five miles or so, <laughs> if she couldn't hitchhike her way home. Jesus, five miles? Yeah. Which it was quite popular in those days just to hitchhike, so they were always hopeful that they could hitchhike, but yeah, they'd walk in the end. So let's skip forward to the morning of the next day, the 15th of July. And it was a Sunday, and Sandra hadn't returned home, which was unusual for her. So her family contacted the police, and a widespread search began of the local area, but to no avail, despite appeals to the public. On the following Tuesday morning, a person out walking discovered Sandra's body at a water oh. culvert. Yes. Now, culvert in this instance is referring to, because it can have different meanings, it's referring to an open water drain that went underground, but her body was at the start of it. And she was three miles from her home. She had been strangled with the hem of her own dress that she had been wearing, and she had also been raped. Oh, now, my goodness. Yes. Now, despite the local papers, nicknaming the killer as a Saturday Night Strangler, they had very little to go on, other than the fact that an Austin 1100 car was seen to be driving very fast out of the town in a location that Sandra would have been in at one point. Oh, wow. Now, sadly, at the time of her death, well, at the time when her body was found anyway, two 11-year-old girls had been killed and raped in one part of the country and an 11-year-old boy had also been killed in another part of the UK. So Sandra didn't get the headlines she deserved in order to make her case known and attract any potential witnesses to come forward. Oh, this is heartbreaking. Yeah, it was literally... Poor family. I know, it was literally like two very short paragraphs after the two girls that had been raped and killed. And, oh, my goodness. And the 11-year-old boy, it was even less. It was like one paragraph after Sandra. It was, yeah, it was just one article. Um, oh, my God. But they say that, don't they? Like, even nowadays, like, what, 40 years later or 40-plus years later, there's this whole, like, press on, you know, what's a desirable missing person? And yeah. Oh, it's just awful. We saw it with Sarah Everard, didn't we? And um, like she absolutely deserved the headlines. But at the time, I think many parents came forward, many parents and loved ones saying that their children, their loved ones were missing, but they just didn't, they didn't, didn't get other than a, a report and in a column in a newspaper, they didn't even get a headline on television. And it's just heartbreaking what, what kind of meets criteria for headlines and constant press versus what doesn't and it's obviously an age factor here isn't it she's 16 she could have run away from home versus like an 11 year old full of innocence really yeah yeah exactly additionally the police were reluctant and therefore didn't acknowledge that she had a boyfriend who was married and they went as far as to release the public that she did not have a boyfriend and they were also very reluctant to make public the fact that she had been raped so 
they also didn't release that information to the public with Detective Chief Inspector Idris Jones telling the press at the time in his statement that he didn't think her attack was committed by a sex maniac. Obviously, this is the terms at the time. You wouldn't use that now. And there was no evidence that she had been sexually assaulted. So they actually came out and said that she hadn't been sexually assaulted when she had quite blatantly been raped. So now that means, now I'm guesstimating here, Rachel, but now that means that they either didn't want it released that she had been raped, which wouldn't make sense, I don't think, to me, because usually the more brutal a murder, the more headlines it will get. Yeah. And the, and that attention is sometimes vital for witnesses to come forward. Or they could have been under the assumption that she had willingly had sex with her killer. Now, remember, this is 1973. So I don't know, Rach. Can you think of any reason why they wouldn't release that information that she had been raped to the press? and actively lie about it. Maybe because they didn't have the answers. And, I, you know, I haven't watched the documentary you're talking about. And in fact, I don't think I've heard about this particular case either. But sometimes I feel the police withhold information because they're not confident that they can, like, back up that information. Like, so if they'd have said she might have known the attacker and had sex with him, would... They've said, well, was she a working girl or was she like, you know, X, Y, Z, and they don't have the answers or making presumptions. I mean, it's very unusual for police officers not to have made assumptions in that day and age, I feel like um, when it was like the Ripper cases, they they wrongly made massive presumptions about all of his victims, didn't they? So, yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, that. That's what I would guess, but can't be sure, obviously. Yeah, obviously, we'll never know. But little was released to the public about Sandra, other than that she didn't have a boyfriend. She went out twice a week and she would hang out with her friends in a cafe. And she would often babysit for her friends when she wasn't working. And that was literally the, the length of what they released about Sandra. Wow. So sadly for Sandra, her killer was not found. And while the investigation remained active, like all murder investigations do, the trail soon went cold and Sander quickly left the public's eye, with the police having no real hope among themselves to bring in a solution to her murder. So now I'd like to skip forward a few months to the 16th of September 1973. And we're again in the early hours of the morning. And again, it's Sunday morning at 1am. And the most popular nightclub in the local area, the top rank, closed its doors at the time so everyone was streaming out and i say the local area we're actually in swansea now so still in okay. Wales, but in swansea so you see rachel the top rank was a place to be back in the late 1973 in swansea there was mini skirts knee-high boots and feather haircuts they were all the rage and with the go-to drink for most people being vodka and lime so give you an idea of the nightclubs back then <laughs> so for Pauline Floyd and her best friend Geraldine Hughes, they were both 16, and it was a, if it was a place to be, then it was a place for them. And despite living some seven miles away, they still wanted to go to the top rank. So they left the top rank and eager to get home and get to sleep after the fun night in each other's company. So the problem was Rachel, though, because they lived seven miles away, and they both worked in a local sewing factory, only £16 a week. Yeah. The, the taxi fare home would cost £4. So that's £2 each. And when they only had £16 a week anyway, it's a lot of money. And there was no buses running that late at night. So they would do what a lot, a lot of other young people would do. They would hitchhike. I mean... I, I think for the benefit of our listeners, it I don't know how what our average age is, but it took me a long time to wrap my head around the fact that my mum and dad had a mortgage of like nine hundred and fifty pounds, I think, in the seventies. No, it must have been it must have been like maybe fifteen hundred. There was something, I don't know, but it was tiny, like basically what what a mortgage payment um might be in this day and age. And I remember thinking, like, I just don't understand it. But, like, it had the, the cost of things has not aged well, has it, at all? Like, no. inflation. I think interest back then was, like, 
stupid amounts, wasn't it? Like 17% and, yeah, things like that. Like, well, it, went really, it was really shit. It went really high. I'm going to have a history lesson here a little bit, but it went really high in 1973 because they had the coal mine strikes. They had the energy crisis where they was only allowed to turn their use electricity, like free, electricity three days a week, the businesses, I think, and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, and there was a war in the Middle East. So, well, still a war in the Middle East, isn't there? But, yeah, um, so, yeah, it, it's a strange time. But, yeah, they would hitchhike. So, fortunately, we also heard about Sandra who hitchhiked. So, it was a wet n- night that night with rain coming down. It was not heavy, but still... You'd still get wet, though, after a while. So I guess you'd imagine both the girls were hoping they'd find someone who would give them a lift sooner rather than later. So, so and was it just normal to hitchhike then? Yes. Like, and yes. your parents would have found it acceptable? And Yeah, it was just, mad. just perfectly normal. So the pair, they had postponed their walk, their walk home, though, for a short while, and hoping to wait out the rain in a bus shelter near the Top Rank nightclub. Now, witness Philip O'Connor, he will later describe how he'd seen a white car, a white Austin 1100. Remember, that's the same type of car that was seen near Sandra. Yeah. Uh, swerving a road towards a bus stop to where the two girls were sheltering from the rain. Oh, God. They then got in the car, both in the front seat, and the driver, by this time, Philip, had pulled up alongside a white Austin 1100. And he looked over, but he couldn't see the driver properly due to the two girls blocking his field of view. And all he could see of the driver was some bushy hair and a moustache. Wow. Now, he did note the two girls looked happy and they willingly got in a car and they were seemingly chatting and laughing in the car with the driver. So he'd probably expect me by now to say the two girls would not make it home because, unfortunately, they didn't. And the next morning at 10 a.m., a pensioner was out for a walk in a wooded copse near Landarcy, and he came across Pauline's body. Now, she was laying face down in the mud. She was lifeless, with her black platform boots beside her. She'd been battered around her head, and her clothing was heavily bloodstained. Oh, my God. A, a large amount of rope, which would later turn out to be around five feet in length, had been wrapped around her neck and had been used to strangle her. After the police arrived, some 50 feet away from Pauline's body, they found uh, Geraldine near the main Jersey Marine Road. And that's a road that's busy at all times of the night and day, Rachel. So she'd obviously be discarded with no attempt at hiding her body. And like her best friend Pauline, she too had been battered around the head and then strangled with a five-foot length of rope from behind. Both girls, who were both virgins, so no assumption could be made about Anything was consensual, like with Sandra, if it had been with her. They both had been raped, with their feet muddy on the bottom of their soles. So it was obvious that the killer had made them strip. He had then raped them and then made them dress again because they had tights on. So the only way for their feet to get muddy was to take the tights off and then put them back on again. This time, the police were determined to catch the killers. Then the similarities between their deaths and Sandra's were enough that the task force to catch the killer was combined, with the police stating in the press that they were treating it as one inquiry, meaning one perpetrator. Something which actually confused me about the modern-day write-ups of this, these crimes, because they say that the police didn't link the two murders, but it's really weird because obviously they couldn't say with definite certainty at the time that it was the same killer because things like DNA didn't exist. No, but but it's the car and yeah, that would be very odd, right? For two different killers to have the same car. In the same localish area as well, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, and they they publicly said they believed it was the same one at the time. So yeah, it's it's really weird that one. But And I've seen the same quote in enough different newspapers from the time of the killing to have any doubt that it was an actual genuine quote as well. So the murder inquiry, it soon became the largest in Welsh police history, with some 150 detectives being tasked to the investigation. But back then, you see, Rachel, nothing was digital. Everything was literal paperwork. In the investigation room, they had a massive whiteboard that covered one entire wall, and they marked it off into small grid lines with lines of inquiry in each box, 
when one had been looked to, they just one. So when one had been looked into, they just manually crossed it off with a marker pen. That's how wow different it is. Yeah. No, would you it, imagine like missing? Well, I imagine it would happen a lot. Just missing, like an inquiry. Just yeah. oh, such and such is looking at that. Like it's like. In, in our day and age, a couple of years ago, we'd have gone off spreadsheets when we were reviewing, like, transactions or whatever. And you, you assign, you know, lines 1 to 50 to Peter and lines 51 to 99 to Paul. But then you think, like, imagine if there was mixed communication and, like, they thought the other one was doing the other. And that that's bad enough. But this is some, this is people's lives on the line. Like, it just, to me, it feels like, I can't believe it was ever. I mean, I get it. There's no other way, but it just feels really yeah. scary how bad it really was. Especially with 150 det- detectives. That's yes. a lot of that confusion that can happen, but yeah. Um, and you see it in TV dramas, don't you? They're all in a room. It's chaos. It's And there's calls coming in. They're trying to file these little cards, aren't they? These few cards that say, oh, you know, just taking a call that says that this this man owns this car and put that in the pile of of contacts to investigate it's it's all just really manual exactly and it was soon determined rachel from enough witnesses of drivers who have been passing the area that a white austin 1100 i remember the same car that was seen picking two girls up and the same type of car seen nearby to the area sandra was missing well yeah. these these witnesses placed the same type of car near the entrance to the wooded copse between 1.45 a.m. and 2.15 a.m. That, that morning, so less than an hour after the girls were last seen. Now, unluckily for the police, however, none of the witnesses could recall the license plate number. They determined that the killer had to have been local and had to have been driving a white Austin 1100. Yeah. So they, they also determined to track down the owner of every white Austin 1100 and speak to them. Now, this was a mammoth task, though, Rachel, because, again, computers were not a thing. So everything was paperwork. So back then, the cards were registered in the local tax offices. So the police had to go to each office. Oh, my God. And get the paper. Yeah. Just gets worse, doesn't it? Yeah, uh, yeah, they had to get the paper records before then locating each owner and verifying their alibi with another person. So in total... There were more than 11,000 white Austin owners in the area that they were looking into. So this created so much paperwork and it made it virtually impossible to be able to cross-reference different bits of paperwork, even though they tried to and would later claim that they did manage to do it. In reality, it would be like virtually impossible to do that. Yeah. They did, however, manage to track down all 11,000 owners were just over and verify an alibi from each of them with an alternative person. So not just say what we're doing, I'd be able to verify that with someone else as well. So that's a mammoth task in itself. Yeah. So, so in the investigation room, they had some 35,000 different index cards with different subject categories, such as this is their words, not mine, queer people, rumours, psychopaths, and that, now that's a worrying one, though, Rachel. I thought that there's enough people they consider a psychopath to create an entire category. Yeah, category. Yeah, that's not good, is it? No, it's all oh, these are just all psychopaths, and they, they even had categories such as pregnant women and psychics. I'm not, I'm not being funny as well, but like you can't categorize people. Like, is no. that their belief? Have they shown behaviors, behaviors, or have these people had previous convictions under, like, you know? I don't know that that kind of headline. I I don't know, yeah. but like when it comes to giving people, putting people in, like could, that would not happen in this day and age, would it? No, I mean the only one of those categories that I've mentioned that they could successfully do would be pregnant women because that'd be pretty well. Yeah, you could easy say to verify. But, that, can you? but but over the no, no, you're right. Like, what's a rumor? Who's a queer person? Who's a psychic? Again, there was not my side. Who's a psychic? It's, yeah, you're right. But in total, they had 10,500 initial suspects. Wow. They had 11,000 questionnaires from all the Austin, Austin car owners. They had 4,000 additional statements from those owners, along with another additional 10,000 statements. Jeez. So it's hard to imagine these days, because all that info, it'd probably fit on your phone. But back, back then, it was all at least one piece of paper 
for each one and sometimes more. So you're talking literally tens of thousands, like over 30,000, almost 40,000 bits of paper, if not more. Mad, so, isn't it? Yeah. So interview it is mad. Interviews many years after the fact would say that the detectives were split on whether Sandra's married boyfriend was a suspect. Some would say he couldn't have been, given he had no driving license and no car, and the bodies were found miles away from where they were last seen, but others thought he was still involved. Yeah, to me, that yeah, that's not like he's super enclosed, is it? No. So Chief Superintendent Allen, who was leading the investigation, would hold a press conference in which he pleaded for the killer's relatives to turn him in. This is what he had to say. We are pretty certain he is being shielded by someone. Could be a woman, could be a relative, or someone close to him. That Sunday morning, his shoes must have been muddy. His clothing could have been bloodstained. This man is sick and needs medical attention. He could kill again unless we can get him to a doctor. Let the police know about him before he kills again. We will look after him. So I I thought that was an interesting tactic there, Rachel, especially in the early 1970s where mental illness was not a well-known thing and it had less focus on it. And, and they described him as sick and needed help, in need of help to appeal to the side that if someone was protecting him, to, to that side of him. I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, no, absolutely. Nine months passed and no leads were developed. And slowly but surely, the massive squad of detectives are assigned to other duties. Like I said before, while I made the investigation, is, is never closed, if not solved. By this time, it wasn't being actively investigated. Geraldine's mother and other relatives of the girls killed, along with a large section of the local community, they did their best to keep the investigation fresh in people's minds, including marching on Downing Street and collecting a petition with thousands of signatures, but the police simply had no clue as to who it could be. Now, due to poor storage over the following decades, most of the physical evidence became mouldy and useless, with the exception of the underwear of the three girls, which was seen as valuable as it had obvious physical evidence on it, and that was stored in some labs owned by the Home Office, in the hope that one day evidence might be found once technology advances. So, Rachel, even when DNA became a thing back in the mid-1980s, it was still not useful in this case, given the size of specimen needed to extract DNA and the fact that it had to be fresh. So by now, the DNA in the girls' items, they were just stains on clothes. So it wasn't fresh. However, in 1998, some 25 years after, a breakthrough occurred in DNA testing. Low-copy number DNA testing was developed, meaning just a speck of DNA could be examined. Now, Rachel, do you remember the live patron episode we did, uh, where we both argued the size of the Peter Falcone murder and Joanna Lees and Bradley Murdoch. I do, I do. And I hate it when you use the term argue, but that's what we wanted to do, wasn't it? Like yes. we we it, we almost went to, to court, didn't we, in that in that concept of like this is what I believe happened and you came at us with, with a different view. Yeah. No. I remember fondly. Yes. Now that was low copy number DNA testing that we discussed uh strongly. So there is some controversy worldwide about this style of DNA testing. But back then, when it first came out, there wasn't any controversy. And it was seen as a breakthrough for law enforcement. So the death of the last two girls, they were opened back up as an active investigation in 1998 when this DNA testing became a thing. So I guess, yeah, like by that time, 25 years has passed. And the three murders were no longer being linked. So while their clothing items had been sent to the two last girls who were killed, sent to a specialist lab in Birmingham for testing, Mm -hmm. it it wasn't straightforward. And it took a whole two years to be tested. Oh, wow. The DNA of the potential killer was all mixed up with DNA of the girls. And the samples by now, they were 25 years old. So they could only get a partial profile of the killer from Geraldine's clothes. However, luckily, from Paulie's clothes, they were able to get a full DNA profile. Now, even though it started in 1988 when the testing began, once they had a full profile, Operation Magnum was launched and a reinvestigation of the murders was officially launched and it was headed up by three experienced police officers, Detective Chief Inspector Paul Bethel and two detectives who had over 30 years' experience each 
Phil Rees and Geraint Bale. Yeah. Now, they at first checked the DNA against the police database of DNA, which at the time held over 1.7 million DNA profiles. But sadly, the killer's DNA was not one of them, so they drew a blank. So they next planned to DNA swab the most likely suspects. But the problem was, Rachel, they only had a budget for 500 swabs, and they had over 35,000 names in the original files. So how did they pick 500 from 35,000? No idea. So they examined the files again, and they discovered a number of unsolved rapes in the local area that had strong similarities to the death of the two girls, including the use of ropes on the victims. The rapes had occurred in the months between Sandra being killed and Geraldine and Pauline's deaths. The problem was, though, they had no DNA evidence because DNA wasn't collected for rapes at the time because it wasn't a thing. The rapist raped the girls in the same manner. He would approach them from behind, attacking them with violence until they submitted, before telling the victim not to struggle or he'd kill them. So I'm thinking just off the top of my head here, Rage, maybe our three deaths, the girls did struggle mm-hmm. if it was the same person. Uh, that's just yeah. a guess there. Um, but he would then ask oh. if they were a virgin before raping them several times. Now, again, oh, yeah. yeah, you remember both Geraldine and Pauline were virgins before they were killed. And all three girls, they were only 16. So they would have looked young enough for someone maybe to assume that they were virgins if he didn't know them. What do you think? Yeah, he's making a lot of assumptions, though, because... No, I'm making I, these assumptions. I imagine, like, obviously it's dark when he's catching them. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it, it it's a dangerous game. Like, not not that murder would never not be a dangerous game, but it's a dangerous game he's playing if he's after a certain victim type because he's, he's not, you know, he's he's acting on a whim, isn't he? And, but, I mean, he's, he's striking lucky at the minute. Yeah, well, no, I was making the, these assumptions, but yeah, he, if he's after that, so yeah, he's he was. But don't forget, it was common back then for girls that young to go out clubbing and girls to hitchhike as well. Yeah. So after he would rape the girls, he would then perform a sex act on himself and say to his victims, Don't open your eyes. I'm going to have a cigarette and think about whether I'm going to kill you or not. Oh, wow. I know, imagine that, Rach, after these, having these horrific acts carried out, and I'm not going into detail on them, but trust me, they were horrific, having them carried out on you and then having to lay there, face down, in on the ground, not knowing if you're about to be killed or not. No, that's just awful, isn't it? I remember Geraldine and Pauline, they were found face down and had been strangled from behind. It's just, it's horrible to think about. Um so they couldn't determine if it was the same person because obviously no DNA, but it was looking likely with the rapes. So with those rapes in mind and the two murders, they drew up a psychological profile. Again, something that was not available to the Welsh police in 1973. And they determined that the killer would be white in his late to mid thirties with a history of minor property crime. He lived locally and would have started coming to the police's attention at around 12 years old. Wow. Wow. Yeah, he would have a history of assaults and animal cruelty. He'd be unskilled and be from a broken home and collect weapons. That's quite a profile, isn't it? Yeah, that's really detailed. And that's actually like spoiler there, we do have a we do have a uh, killer court at the end. So remember those and see how accurate that was at the end, shall we? Yeah. So with that profile in mind, they started filtering the names of the suspects they had. And it took them years to go through all the paperwork. Because remember, this was individual pieces of paperwork. And so by the time they had their 500 names, nearly 30 years had now passed. And it was a long time. So trying to locate these 500 people was, was very difficult. People would move or die. They would change names. They would even leave the country. So it wasn't a case of just going to the same address that they had recorded. So not only locating them, they also then, once they had located them, they had to get the suspects to agree to a DNA sample because they had to do it voluntarily. They couldn't force them to. So they used, they tried to search on DNA records, their passport office, their criminal records, the tax office records, uh, not the DNA, sorry, record, DVLA records, bit of difference okay. there. Um, so and they, anything they could do to find the people. And over an eight-month period, they managed to find and get all 355 people that they found 
to agree to DNA swap, but all 355 people came back negative. Wow. And every time they swapped someone, it in itself created another mountain of paperwork. No, they had prioritized the 500 into different groups and the level of importance to get swapped based on the likelihood that they could be the killer. Oh, oh bless her. Hello, Mom. Sorry, can you uh, hear that? Yes. Now, number 200 on their list was Joseph Capin, who lived in nearby Port Talbot. And in August of 2001, they went to visit him, but he wasn't living at the same address anymore. Only his ex-wife was. Now, she informed them that he had been dead for 12 years, so they wouldn't find him. Now, obviously, they had to confirm this, so they checked with death records to make sure that this was true. And then they moved him to the dead category. They, oh. they, they planned, after they had located all the living suspects, to, their, to them try to DNA the relatives of the men in the dead category to see if they could get a potential hit that way. So in October 2001, they had a breakthrough. They managed to extract DNA from swabs taken off Sandra's body. Do you remember the first girl that died? Yep. And once and for all, they could say with certainty that it was the same killer of all three girls. So now they had an official serial killer on their hands. Wow. They were able to rule out Sandra's married boyfriend because they did also find his DNA on also on Sandra, but they also found the killer's DNA. So it was two different people. Because of the location of Sandra's body, they knew that the killer had to live locally. There was no way anyone would have known about that location if they were not local. So they now had a lead. Not only must he be a local man, he must also drive that Austin 1100, remember? Mm -hmm. So they they know that he must have already been spoken to because they spoke to every single Austin 1100 owner. So they asked themselves, how could they help identify the killer? So this is when it dawned on them. And this is why this case interested me, Rachel, and I chose it because they thought, well, this happened in 1973. There's a big chance that the killer had kids and they could be adults now. Could that relative be in their DNA database? And this had never been done before. So they managed to reduce 22,000 possible suspects down to just 100. Wow. And they had, and this was done by a computer as well now, so it was a lot quicker. Now, it never, this had never been done before, Rachel. It was groundbreaking. And out of those 100 names was Paul Capin was a car thief who would live locally now his father was joseph capping do you remember him yep the guy who died 12 years before yeah now, now he was now their main suspect so they returned to joseph's ex-wife and they convinced her and her daughter to give dna samples so dna works just for the people that may not know uh, the child gets 50 percent from their mother and 50 percent from their father so they, they could remove Joseph's ex-wife's DNA from the two children's DNA, and then they would have a complete DNA profile for the father. So it came back as a partial match to the DNA taken from the girls. So now we're virtually certain he was a killer, but it was a statistically certain certainty. They couldn't give a definitive answer to the relatives, and they wanted to give a definitive answer to the relatives. So they sought permission to exhume his body and five months later, it was granted. So while, yeah. they were, while they were waiting, they looked into who Joseph Capon was. And it turned out he was a bouncer in a local area who was prone to violence. He owned an Austin 1100. He came from a broken family. Remember the psychological profile said all of these things. Yeah. He first came to the attention of the, to the police as a 12-year-old. Again, do you remember matching the profile? Yeah. He had a string of minor offences from property theft and assault. Again, matching the profile. Yeah. This is crazy how accurate the yeah. profile was. In that it, day, like all the way back then, do you know what I mean? It's, it yeah. is mad. His ex-wife told him about how he used to beat her regularly, how he used to vapor every two weeks until she finally got the courage to leave him in 1980. And now do you remember the profile saying cruelty to animals? Yeah. They had a pet greyhound. And now this, by the way, makes me ha makes me happily say I really do hope he is rotting in hell. But one day, he was walking the greyhound on the beach with his son, and he suddenly decided the greyhound was too old. So he picked up some wire from the beach. Oh, my God. No, no. Yeah, he strangled it to death. No, no, no. Yeah, he strangled it to death in front of his son. 
in front of his son. Another instance was when he forced his two children, who were at this time both under the age of 10, at the time, to walk the streets at 11 o'clock at night in the pouring rain, trying to find him some fig rolls, because to replace the ones of his that they'd eaten. So he was a horrible, violent man. So when they visited him, the original police, remember, because they did visit every Austin 1100 owner, he did have an Austin 1100 on his driveway, which was on bricks, and he told the police it was out of action, and it hadn't been driven in months. So remember they also said they wanted to get an alibi from an independent source. Yeah. So the alibi was backed up by his then wife, who confirmed it out of fear because he regularly beat and raped her. Oh, what a nasty piece of work. So so that's why he was discounted as a suspect, as a suspect, because the police thought she his car was out of action. Yeah, and it wasn't his wife's fault. He, he was obviously, she was in a very abusive relationship. So he had died in 1990 of lung cancer at the age of 49. Wow. That's probably going to make me a horrible man, but when I read that, I thought, I hope it was painful. But um, It doesn't make you a horrible man at all. This mm. man was a nasty piece of work. And, yeah. yeah. And when the DNA tests came back from, because they dug up his grave after five months, it confirmed that he was the killer. So this was, according to all I had read, the first time a familial DNA test had been used to catch a killer. So that's why I wanted to call this, even though people may have watched the uh, BBC drama about it. And it's now known that the serial killers don't just stop, do they? They don't just kill a few times and stop. No. And this was 1973, and he died in 1990. Wow. So, so they believe that he most likely killed more, and he most definitely raped more. They think he raped all those women, but they couldn't prove it. And there was one story, actually, about how the girls didn't report it at the time because they thought they'd get in trouble with the father. But oh, he, my God. But he picked two girls up who were hitchhiking, and then he drove them to a remote area, and he started, like, groping them. And he'd fix his car so that the back door couldn't be opened. And um, it was only because he started to try to rape them. And it was only because one of the girls had fingernails and she like scratched him and then tried to and managed to get the car to open. They both ran away. But this came out after the fact. So he, oh. al- he also like would have probably killed them. And this was before the two girls were killed. So he probably did like definitely rape more people. And I'm guessing they probably did kill more people, but but obviously back then DNA wasn't a thing; it wasn't really collected, was it? And often, like, yeah. and they were they were lucky with these girls that their clothes were stored, but that didn't happen every single time. So um, they they yet to be matched DNA to anything. But every six months, apparently, they run his DNA through the database to see if any new hits come. And he was also a long distance lorry driver for a short time, so that means he could have killed in other parts of the UK too. So what do you think of this one, Rachel? I mean, it it's a tragic case. What a nasty piece of work. I think it is one thing killing human beings. Like, people seem to have vendettas against, like, certain profiles of women. They've grown up in a household where their mother wasn't kind to them or that, you know, their sister, you know, I don't know, died in tragic circumstances and, and men therefore profile a certain kind of woman to, you know, kill and 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 that kind of thing. But the fact that he he was just an awful human being, and then had on top of that had with the animal abuse, like awful. This it's a horrible case. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. I don't think there's much more I can add to that. The horrible. No, man. sorry. Just... Oh, I'm glad. Like finally. He came to justice, like the family, the relatives had closure, but it's, it's a horrible one. Yeah. So shall I wrap this one up then, Rachel? Yeah. Get this horrible man out of our heads. Yeah. So, so this has been season four, episode 16, called Family Connection. And if it's safe for you to do so, I'd like you to relax, close your eyes and picture the scene. So how, how many countless unsolved murders do we hear about on a regular basis? Could one of your family members, even if they've passed away, could they be a killer? Have a oh. think about it. So thank that's, you. That's the scary. Sorry, sorry, Andrew. I haven't interrupted you this whole show. <laughs> that's the scary thing. That all the familial DNA sites now, 
Um, good thing, don't get me wrong, but fucking scary as well, isn't it? Let's be yeah. honest. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah, so thank you everyone for, for listening to us and join us next week for another another interesting case. Yeah, yeah, I can um I, yeah, I can hardly wait. Mm-hmm.